my Messiah mine Lift me to the holy place My Messiah mine Shine thy light upon my face Lift the darkness from my eyes Let me see where Satan lies Let me know the joy of life Known only through you My Messiah mine How I long to be your bride My Messiah mine Through you there's eternal life Let me learn of you all I can Guide me with your gentle hand Let me know that I am always loved by you the blood immerse me in your spirit Yahshua oh let me drink your living waters let me sacrifice the blood immerse me in your spirit Yahshua Messiah mine You have healed my many scars My Messiah mine I love you with all my heart Let me live through your grace Let my soul be your hiding place For I know that I just can't face this world without you Let me drink you living waters Let me sacrifice the blood Immerse me in your spirit, Yahshua Let me drink your living waters and sacrifice the blood. Oh, oh, immerse me in your spirit, your spirit. Lift me up, my Yahshua. Let me drink your living waters and sacrifice the blood. Immerse me in your spirit, your spirit. Lift me up. My Messiah mine, lift me to the holy place. My
Caught up in a world they say happened by chance They want to believe that it's all in their hands They try to convince me they shape their own destinies But if they knew ya like I knew ya They'd get down on their knees Yes, if they knew ya like I know ya They get down on their knees They don't know He's in complete control Elohim is running this show, yeah He's in complete control Elohim is running this show Freedom of choice is the law They're spreading around Divine intervention is nice if God is ever around. They don't want to believe their every step was patterned by him. That he's got it wrapped up tight, line upon line. They're going back to spirit again. He's got it wrapped up tight, line upon line. They're going back to spirit again. Evil, you know. 
And um, the president of Assyria, who's very good friends, they kind of remind me of the Pharaoh, you know. And, you know, if you remember the, uh, when uh, Moses went and talked to the Pharaoh, Yahweh said, let my people go. The Pharaoh said, who is Yahweh that I should do? Then he changed his mind. Well, if you really look at the, the president of Syria, isn't that what he's saying? He was supposed to leave, he was supposed to find and go to find an exile somewhere that he decided to fight and, you know. So you can look at some of the comparison. Isn't it amazing that nothing changes, everything repeats itself, mm. you know? And there is a reason why the Middle East is in turmoil, you know? Mm -hmm. Look at it. You have two mystery um, in operation, but Satan is fighting against himself. Okay, mm -hmm. and it, it, it is because you know um, he's. I'm calling it. I'm looking at it, and I'm saying, okay, Asher. He's trying to consolidate. Mm -hmm. He is. Mm -hmm. And what is he consolidating? That new religion, what is called a religion? Islam. Huh? Islam, the jihadists, whatever they're <coughs> called, the, the religion. You know, they're killing uh, the so-called Christians, okay? So he's consolidating power, you know? He's um, and getting rid of the so-called Christian and imposing his religion or his belief or whatever that religion is, and I don't know all the the ins and outs because I don't know why I started talking about that. <laughs> you know, I was, you know, I should talk in about and get the scripture for this building, which is what I had in my mind. I don't know where I went there. Um, so, you know, I know Rhonda used to say, you know, that Martha, when you started in this teaching, you should always pay attention to the news. It's very important that you look at it, you know, or watch the news. And you know, that stayed with me because she said, and I don't, don't know this for a fact, and I never read it, that Dr. King said you must always be vigilant and watch the news so you can see stuff. I never seen that, I never read it anywhere. I'm just repeating what someone else says. So if I misquote it, you know, I'm sorry, you know. But so I've been watching the news, and I'm watching our president, you know, make a decision, change his mind, and I'm saying, what does all this mean, you know? And the only thing I could come, you know, is, uh, you know, pay no attention. Where's that scripture that said, when you hear rumors of war, stand, you know? Is it in Matthew? And then, uh, can you get me Daniel? Uh, also where it says, it stands in the holy place. Matthew 24, starting at 5. Mm -hmm. I'll start at 4. Okay. And Yahshua answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Mm -hmm. For many shall come in my name, saying, I mm -hmm. am the Messiah, and shall deceive many. Mm -hmm. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrow. 9. Then shall they deliver you up to the afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated for all nations for my name's sake. Okay, and can you, was it eight that you just read? Yes. So we, you can see we have, um, first we went into Iraq, then we have, what's the name that I, I, the AF. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> and so, you know, if you look at it, who do you see laying here? You see Daniel, you know. And it's always there. Look where it's in Babylonia. Well, this is, this is the area that we're having problems. Now, you know, Egypt is um, having problems. Um, Assyria. The only other country that is missing is Jordan. Uh, Israel, well, Israel, you know, and 
Jordan, Israel, and I forget the other, like four or five countries are not in this. But you know what? They are getting pulled in, you know. Turkey. Yeah, yes, I was looking for Turkey. So, the, you know, and it's all about, you know, what is our interest in those nations? Oil. Really oil, but guess what? We have abundant oil in this country, you know. So, but, you know, um, that's our interest, but that's from us. to change regime, uh, govern, uh, government, but uh, influenced by religion, you know, uh, put a new order, or new religion, or new whatever it is that they're trying to do. So you can see some of the spiritual significance. Uh, Through you there's eternal People are unemployed, 50% of the nation. I know people don't know that. We have a famine. And also the biggest famine that we have is? Here in the gospel. There you go. So we can look at, the, you know, and there would be a time, and the time is coming, that saying Yahweh or Yahshua can be very difficult, you know. It's coming because they're going to judge you. You're going to be judged if you don't praise their religion or you don't praise. And also, it's spreading. Look, here in the U.S., just here in Michigan, just go down to Dearborn, here in Lansing. You know, it's, it's everywhere. It's spreading, you know. It, it, look at the people, but remember, people carry the message. You know, if you don't have Yasha, then you know there's someone else in that body. You cannot have an empty vessel. Right? Or you either have Yeshua or you have something else. Okay. So, you know, so when I think I'm looking at the news and I said, okay, there's a famine, there is something going on, but don't you worry about it. It's, you know, um, but you should prepare. And the preparation is n not just knowing the gospel, knowing Yeshua, from a physical standpoint, I hate to say this, you, suppose, you need to herd food. You need to put seeds away, and you need to put canned product away. You know, because, you know, you're going to need it. I have always had water in my refrigerator, and I change it every month or so, you know. For the reason is when, you know, I grew up in earthquakes and hurricanes and water is very important, yes. And canned food and food. And believe it or not, you can trade uh, tuna for something. So look at it that way. I don't know why I'm going without this. But anyway, um, I'm just going to touch on the last two things, which is what I had in my mind. You know, it's the 70 um, elders here. So can we get the scripture, Matthew 16? And, you know, um, this is um, um, from the law, and this is Yahshua fulfilling it. So, um, well, let's start with Exodus 24, vision of Elohim in an incorporeal form. Exodus 24, 1. Exodus 24 and 1. Mm -hmm. And he said unto Moses, mm -hmm. Come up unto Yahweh, mm -hmm. thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, mm -hmm. and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. Mm -hmm. And Moses alone shall come near Yahweh, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of Yahweh and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which Yahweh hath said, 
will we do? And Moses wrote all the words of Yahweh and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto Yahweh. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And they said, all that Yahweh hath said will we do, and be obedient. Mm -hmm. and you know, what I'm looking for, and I don't know, um, is where the seventh elders, uh, the Elohim of Israel with a sapphire. Yep, it's coming up. It's right, it's next. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, you want me to just keep going through? Yes, okay. of course. Okay. Yeah. okay. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which Yahweh hath made with you concerning all these words. Nine. You know, but if you heard that the, in the blood of the covenant is sprinkled, that's a physical um, baptism. You know, you sprinkle, mm. you know, mm. um, and that was symbolizing in the blood of Yahshua, you know, mm. because when he died, his blood spilled, you know. And now we are baptized, you know, with a new covenant by his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Mm -hmm. Continue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, mm -hmm. and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the Elohim of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw Elohim and did eat and drink. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Come up into the mount and be there. And I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments, which I have written. Okay. And Moses rose up and his minister, Yahshua. And Moses went up into the mount of Yahweh. And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. Did it say seventy elders in there? Uh huh. It said it, um, then went nine. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So, you know. So this is the law, and then if you come here, you can see in this tra transfiguration, it says 70 chosen, mm -hmm. and we have here Aaron, Nebuchadnezzar, and Abihu, and we have here Peter, James, and John, okay? Mm -hmm. And we have here Moses and John the Baptist, okay? So can we get... Um, which one would that be? I have Matthew 17 and 1. If you want the 70, I can give you that in Luke. Okay, that's great. Mm -hmm. Luke 10 and 1. After these things, Yahweh appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whether he himself would come. Okay. And now, then if you want the transfiguration, that's Matthew 17. Yeah. Matthew 17 and 1. And after six days, Yahshua taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Mm -hmm. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Yahshua, Master, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Mm -hmm. Hear ye him. Okay. So, you know, uh, 70 was chosen. We have the 70 elders chosen here. We have the three Aaron, Nebuchadnezzar, and Abihu. Okay. And we have... Um, James and John are brothers, right? And Peter, and we had Peter who, you know, uh, um, 
Satan was in him because he jumped and said, let's build a tabernacle and all that. And we can get into, I, don't, I won't get into the detail. So I just wanted to compare uh, the 70 chosen and the 70 elders. And um, this is like a confirmation and it helps you feel secure in this gospel that, you know, you have the law. We say, you know, the law and the testimony, so, and, you know, Yasha fulfilled all things, and just choosing a little piece, you can, you know, without going into the big picture, just those little things, you can see how Yasha has fulfilled, and that um, he has everything under control from the beginning to the end. And uh, with that, I say hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Cern. And at this time, I'd like to call on the Dean of the Lansing Branch, Dr. Terry Walsh. Thank you. Well, good morning. I uh, was listening to the remarks of the previous speaker and kind of realized a couple things about uh, the topics that she was referring to. First of all, of these things that are going on over in the Middle East, um, Dr. Kinley did say to watch the Middle East and that those things that were going on over there would be signs. Now, that wasn't something that, Yash, that Dr. Kinley came up with without confirmation in the scriptures and you were going to the 24th chapter of Matthew. I'm going to touch on a couple of things there and then uh, hopefully we'll get into a, a kind of a related subject which we need to spend a little bit of focus on. If you go to the 24th chapter of the book of Matthew and um, just start at the first verse. This 24th chapter of Matthew is referred to quite often, but the whole chapter needs to be understood as part of an entire message. And it has a context, or in other words, it's set within a particular set of circumstances, um, and the things that are being said here are relevant in those circumstances, and as with everything, they fit into a pattern that repeats. But quite often, I think we don't recognize how they fit into those circumstances there at that time in that situation first. It's kind of like saying, okay, there was a sacrifice here on the altar, and then without understanding anything about sacrifices, then we jump and say, Yahshua was the sacrifice. Well, okay, that's true. What does that mean? To understand that, the context of a sacrifice is in here. Okay, in other words, the way a sacrifice is offered, what is it done, what's the importance of it, what's the significance. And she talked about the sacrifices that were made at Mount Sinai at the beginning of the Old Covenant. And I'm going to refer to this in a minute here because I'll want Hebrews, the ninth chapter, starting about the 15th verse, where Paul talks about those particular things. Okay, and then refers to how those things tell about Yahshua the Messiah, okay? So these people back here, they offered the blood of bulls and goats, right? She needed, it says back there, he had young men offer bullocks and so forth, and he sprinkled half the blood on the people and, you know, half the blood on the altar and so forth and, and, and said, this is the covenant that Yahweh hath enjoined unto you. Well, that is a, con there's a context for that. That's the situation, the circumstances involved. And it points to Yahshua the Messiah. We go back here and understand this a little better. We'll understand what he did a little better. Okay? All right. But go to the 24th chapter of Matthew, please. Matthew 24 and 1. Mm -hmm. And Yahshua went out and departed from the temple. Okay, now, this is very toward the very end of Yahshua's ministry. Uh, very close to the time that he is going to end up being crucified. Okay? 
So he has basically fulfilled just about everything that he needs to fulfill in that physical body. And he has his 12 disciples with him, and they are following him, and they have become accustomed to following him, watching him, listening to him, being, uh, I think this is not a word in the Bible, but dumbfounded by what he's doing, going, what was that all about? And then at night, going up into the mountain and, and around the campfire, Yahshua the Messiah would explain to him or to them what he was doing. And quite often he would explain it in the context of parables that he had spoken during the day. Just like, you know, Yahweh took Moses up here in the mountain and in the fire, right? Because that's what that was, a pillar of fire. And that's where he would explain to Moses what was going on and what his purpose was. So Yahshua the Messiah would fulfill that by going up into the mountain at night and explaining to his disciples. Okay? So here, at the end of the, uh, uh, his ministry, he is down in the temple during the day. And then he leaves and he goes and departs from the temple. And, he's, and here's what happens. Go ahead. And Yahshua went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Stop. Okay. Were they just being tour guides? No. They weren't just saying, oh, look at this particular, um, oh, what do they call that? The, uh, how people build things. <laughs> architecture. Okay, yeah. Right. Oh, look at this particular style of architecture. That wasn't the point. What was important in their mind about this temple? What was important? Why did they show him the buildings of the temple? Because that was a physical temple that, you know, I think it said in... Well, they had Offering of sacrifices. sacrifices. They had a place for their sacrifices. Okay. And... That's where they worshipped. And that's where they worshipped. That's exactly right. And where was it located? In Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. See, this was all important. Because here's what had happened. Those people, remember, there had been uh, 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 500 or um, 1,000 years earlier, Solomon's temple built. And where Solomon's temple was built, Yahweh called that his house. He called Jerusalem the place where he placed his name. This is where Yahweh w w uh, had his spirit present. This is where th was the capital of his kingdom. This is where he ruled the kingdom of Yahweh at that time called the kingdom of Israel. And they enjoyed a great glorious existence there, okay, when Yahweh had made them great. And that had all been destroyed, okay? The, all of that had been destroyed. The, peop, the temple had been destroyed. The, the vessels had been sacked, taken away. Even the Ark of the Covenant at one point had been taken away. Mm -hmm. And it was recovered. The Ark of the Covenant was. Later on, uh, it, it was there, and Jeremiah ended up hiding it in a cave, okay, and, and so forth. And that Ark of the Covenant was showing the throne in the presence of Yahweh. And without that, it was as if Yahweh was not with them. It was as if Yahweh was not their king, fighting for them, putting them in a kingdom, and so forth. And the kingdom of Yahweh is the main message of all the scriptures. When we talk about the gospel, the gospel, what's good about it, is getting you translated into the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah. If Yahshua's death, burial, and resurrection did not create the means to translate you into the kingdom of Yahshua, then his death, burial, and resurrection would not have done the most important thing. Okay? So it's all about his kingdom. And this is what's in these people's mind. These people have been put down as a group. Okay? The Jews have been destroyed, sacked, uh, dispersed. Um, they, they, they've been... Uh, uh, just put under the thumb of all these different Gentile nations for hundreds and hundreds of years. They are at this point in Matthew uh, 24, when this is being read, they're under the thumb of the Romans. 
They resent it. Okay? They are all about the kingdom of Israel. And Yahshua, John the Baptist, and so forth, came and their message was, the kingdom, repent, for the kingdom of Yahweh is at hand. These people thought that what that meant was that he would restore the physical kingdom of Israel to its prior state of glory in the years of David and Solomon. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is what's in their mind. And the temple was a necessary, not just a symbol, but a central point for the kingdom of Yahweh to exist as it had existed at that time. And in their mind, without the temple, Yahweh's kingdom could not come. Now, they did not have the Ark of the Covenant, and what I'm telling you is in the mind of the Jewish people today. The temple, they believe, has to be built on that same spot, that same piece of ground, the same exact geographic location in order for the kingdom of Yahweh, or in their mind, the kingdom of Israel, to come. And of course, yes, the Ark of the Covenant is also essential which is part of the reason why there's so many myths and ideas about the Ark of the Covenant being found but kept back because they don't want to bring it out until they're ready to show the whole thing and, and for the kingdom of Yahweh to end up becoming very glorious. And in much of evangelical Christian belief, mm -hmm. the same ideas are there. They believe that this is the fulfillment of prophecy, that there has to be a physical temple built on that spot, that the Ark of the Covenant has to be brought out, that that temple has to be dedicated with blood. You remember you talked about how these people dedicated this covenant with blood back here. And then you'll find out that the tabernacle was dedicated with blood. The temple was dedicated with blood. So they want the same exact thing to happen again. And they figure that that has to be the, quote, fulfillment of prophecy. Not the blood of Yahshua, the blood of bulls and goats. They think that. Not the temple as the spiritual assembly of souls joined to Yahshua, but the temple as a physical building here in physical Jerusalem rather than in Jerusalem above, which is the mother of us all. You understand what I'm saying? These people have in mind a great physical kingdom, okay, and an overthrow of Rome. I'm talking about Yahshua's disciples. So how long have they been building this temple? that they're showing him. 49 years by the time of Matthew 24, 46 years in the beginning of Yahshua's ministry. And this scripture to me is a necessary scripture to give you the context of, Ma of the entire book of Matthew 24. We'll go back to Matthew 24, but I want you to get John 2.29. Okay? When, 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 I, when I read how Dr. Kinley taught about this, and connected this through, uh, it made me have to puzzle, kind of like these disciples puzzled about what Yahshua was doing, and then he showed me why this was so important. So read in John 2.29, which is at the beginning of Yahshua's ministry, this is in the year that Yahshua was baptized. Yahshua's baptism basically is the public announcement or the place uh, at, after which his uh, public ministry is announced by John the Baptist. Go ahead and read. John 1 and 29. 2, 29. There is no 2 and 29. 2. You want the next day John seeth? 2, 29? Maybe it's not 2, 29. I, you know, I got to look at scriptures. It's 2, pretty sure it was in the 22nd, 20, pretty sure it was in the second chapter. It's where uh, they talk, well, I'll just find the scripture for you. Okay. I'll find the scripture for you. Two, verse, maybe it's verse nine. Okay. Try verse nine. John two and nine. Yes. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water. That's not it. Okay. What is I've it got saying? a note here in my book and I can't even read without my glass anymore. Try 19. Oh, Thank okay. you. Yep. 
John 2 and 19. Yep. Yahshua answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple. Okay, now back up. Just okay. a little bit so we understand what's being said. Right. This is, again, at the beginning of Yahshua's ministry. It's the year that Yahshua was water baptized. That is right at, and then right after that, John the Baptist announces Yahshua as the Lamb of Yahweh that comes to take away the sin of the world. Remember, John has been preaching, repent, the kingdom of Yahweh is at hand. Yahshua preaches, repent, the kingdom of Yahweh is at hand. He sends the 12 disciples to preach the same thing about the kingdom of Yahweh, he sends the 70 that Marta had talked about, the 70 in Yahshua's time, he sends them out to preach the same thing about the kingdom of Yahweh. Read John 2, uh, what verse are you going to start at? 13 to pick up train of thought. Okay, go ahead. Okay, John 2 and 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and mm -hmm. Yahshua went up to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the changers of money sitting. Okay. And when so he, what he does, he finds them defiling the temple, okay, and he casts them out, which is a fulfillment of casting the demons out of heaven, and uh, he says that my father's house should be called a house of prayer, and in the Old Testament where that's written, it says a house of prayer for all people, which includes the Gentiles, okay, and he says, but they had made it a den of thieves. Now pass that part. I want to get to the next part. Oh, okay. So he's in the temple. Go ahead. Uh, 17? Yep. And his disciples. So he cleanses the temple. He purges the temple by casting them out. Okay, go ahead and read. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Mm -hmm. Then answered the Jews and said unto him. So you can see how Yahshua was very zealous about Yahweh's house or about the temple, right? And remember in Matthew 24, his disciples came to Yahshua to show him the buildings of the temple. They feel zealous about the temple. Okay? So this is in the very beginning of his ministry. Read it, please. What sign showest thou unto us? And the Jews ask him about a sign. In other words, you're saying all this stuff, you're doing all this stuff, you're acting with authority as if you've got authority in this temple, but you're not a Levite, right? Okay? You, we don't see any reason to believe that you're, you have any authority. You're not of the, of, of the uh, family of the high priest. You're not uh, of the Sadducees or the Pharisees, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What sign do you show? In other words, what's your proof that you got any right to even talk, much less do anything? Go ahead and read. What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Mm -hmm. Yahshua answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, he said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll build it up. Now, he's just been in Herod's temple. Right? Just cast those people, the money changers, out of Herod's temple. Okay? So, they ask about a sign. And that's important. They ask about a sign. Yahshua has just departed from the temple. They ask about a sign. And he says... Okay, you ask about a sign, you destroy this temple, I'll build the temple in three days. Go ahead. Then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building? We've been building this thing for 46 years. Now, look, I understand that there are delayed construction projects. Okay, that happens all the time. But they have limited resources situation. It, would, did, it was not unusual for them to take many, many years to build a particular building. But this had taken a long time, and folks, this temple was absolutely gorgeous. It was a, a work that these people were proud of, and they, they took great, incredible pride in this temple. Okay? They vested their own pride in existence in this temple. And they said, we have been building this temple for 46 years. Go ahead and read. Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? How are you going to raise it up in three days? Okay. Now, read on. 21. But he spake of the temple of his body. See, he was not talking about Herod's temple. He was talking about the temple of his own body. Folks, here's the thing. Yahshua was the fulfillment or the reality of everything. Mm -hmm. He is the reality and the end-all be-all when it comes to the sacrifices. He is the reality and the end-all be-all when it comes to the temple. 
He is the reality and the end-all be-all when it comes to the priest. He's the sacrifice. He's the temple. He's the priest. He is the kingdom. He is the king. He is the one that all of these things are testifying to. But these people certainly don't realize it. Okay? And so what's going on here is at the beginning of Yahshua's ministry, he's saying these things. And I want to mention the context in terms of the timeline. Okay? They said that we've been building this temple for how many years? 46. 46 years. Right? And that's the year that Yahshua was, I've mentioned this three times already. 30. What happened with Yahshua at that year? 30. Ministry. He was baptized and went into his ministry. Right? Okay, now, the baptism was a baptism in water. You see the water here in the tabernacle? Okay. How many feet was it from the gate, which is the entrance into the tabernacle, to the laver with water? 46. 46 feet. Okay. So, the year that Yahshua was baptized is uh, the 46th year that that temple has been being built. Okay? Just like the, where the baptism symbolically occurs here is the 46th foot of the tabernacle. And how old is Yahshua when he's baptized? 30. About 30, right? Third what step. step is this? Three. The third step, 3, 0, 30. So the tabernacle, Yahshua is moving according to the tabernacle pattern. Now, how many years is Yahshua going to be in his ministry? Three. Three or three and a half years, which is going to, if you add three onto 46, how many do you get? Nine. They're 49, nine. right? And 49 is a cycle of seven sevens, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now, every 50th year, what did Yahweh have? He had a jubilee, which is a year of release, which is a year uh, 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 where Yahweh is showing the, the, the grace of his own kingdom, okay? the grace and the mercy of his kingdom, and they get complete rest and Sabbath and so forth in the year of jubilee. So the year that Yahshua ends his ministry will bring in a year of jubilee. Do you follow me? So when Yahshua in the 24th chapter of Matthew is shown the buildings of the temple by his zealous disciples, how many years has the temple been in the building then? Wait, what? Say it again. What did you say? Say it again. Right. 49 years. Right? Okay. I want you to follow this. I'm trying to, I'm, so you understand what the context is here. The beginning of Yahshua's ministry, the temple's been being built for 46 years, right? Yahshua's 30. I just showed you that right here. Three more years, or three and a half years, Yahshua's in his ministry, okay? And that would be the 49th year going into the 50th year that the temple is being built, okay? And, of course, the 49 is the cycle of seven sevens and being perfection, okay? And then going on into the 50th, and the principle there is seven. So how many feet is it from the gate to the door? Six. Seventy Seven. feet <laughs> all the way to the gate to the door. It's 69 to where the priest stood at the door. That's correct. That's right. And the priest took up that one foot, meaning the 70th foot. That's correct. So... The principle of seven is there, just like 49 is seven sevens, right? And then after that, you get to what number? After 49? 50. 50. And the base number of 50 is? Five. Five. So when you go into the holy place from there, what number is that? Five. It's the fifth step. You follow me? Yahshua the Messiah is following this pattern in his whole ministry, okay? All right, now... So, they're very zealous about this temple. He says, uh, tear a temple down, and in three days I'll raise it back up again. His death, his burial, and his resurrection, symbolized by the death of the sacrifice, the burial at the laver, and the resurrection going into the holy place, are those three days or three years that are necessary in order to fulfill that and bring uh, uh, someone on into the holy place or into the kingdom of Yahshua. Okay? Alright, now, so 
He spoke of the temple of his body back there at the beginning of his ministry. They've been building on this temple three more years. At the end of Yahshua's ministry, his disciples now are showing him the temple, and they're extremely proud of this temple because to them it means the kingdom of Yahweh is at hand. And their hopes are in this physical building, a physical kingdom. But that's not Yahshua's plan. That's not Yahshua's kingdom. It's not the physical kingdom of Israel. It is, because he said, my kingdom is not of this world. Right? Okay? So it's a spiritual kingdom. Okay? It's a spiritual temple. And you get on down to this. And so Yahshua says in the 24th chapter of Matthew, go ahead and read it now. Matthew 24 and 2. Mm hmm and Yahshua said unto them, See ye not all these things? These things what? The temple. Go ahead. Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Stop. Do you see that? That refers back to what Yahshua said at the beginning of his ministry. He said, You want a sign? He says, Here's the sign. Tear this temple down. Right? And in three days I'll build it up again. Right? But he spoke of what temple? The temple of his body. Now, the physical temple is going to be torn down, the one that they're looking at, okay? But his physical body, which is the true temple, is going to be torn down very, just within days of the time that Yahshua says this to them in the 24th chapter of Matthew, okay? So his physical body is the temple, okay? And he's going to raise it up in three days, and what's he going to raise up? A spiritual body, a spiritual temple. Okay, so that's going to be the fulfillment of what he said back there in John 2, 19, not 29, <laughs> where he says, tear this temple down, and in three days I'll raise it up again. Okay, all right, so um, he says, see, see not all these things, there shall not be left one stone upon another that is not going to be thrown down. Please read. Third verse, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives. Now, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives. Now, wait a minute. Why would he sit on the Mount of Olives? Do you remember I told you that Yahshua would do things and say things that his disciples would be very like perplexed about, right? And then they would have to come to him and ask him, why'd you say that? Why'd you do that? What's that all about, Master? Follow me? Because they wouldn't understand. They thought things should be done different. Because they had a whole different idea in their mind. They had the idea we're going to have to have a physical kingdom of Israel. Right? And Yahshua wasn't about that. Okay? And so at night, they went up into the Mount of Olives. Just like Moses went up here, and these are what they call the night visions. Although I'll tell you this, Moses was never in the dark. Okay? But Yahshua would go up in the Mount of Olives at night... Get, look, where did they come to get Yahshua when they sent the, the, the soldiers and them to take Yahshua to arrest him? In the Garden of? Which is where? In the Mount of Olives. How did Judas know where to come get him? That's where he hung out. Right? He's just repeating. He'd been there before. Up and down and up and down the mountains. Right? So now, at, at night, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him. Read it, please. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? Now, they didn't say to him. They finally knew better than to say to him, Oh, Master, no, no, that's not going to happen. They're not going to tear this temple down. Because he just said it's going to be torn down. So instead of that, because that's what they wanted. They didn't want that temple torn down. But they figured by now, hey, if he says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. <laughs> so now they go, well, at least tell us this. When is this going to happen? Go ahead and read. And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And they realized, based on all the things he said and done before, that he's talking about this because he said, tear this temple down, I'll build it in three days. Right? So that means it's going to be his temple. Right? 
His kingdom. Right? He's the Messiah. He's the king that they're waiting for, even though he doesn't do it the way they expect. So he says, so they say, what shall be the sign of your coming as the king and the end of the age or the end of the world as they know it? Do you follow me? The end of the Roman Empire. Because the Roman Empire was called the world. Okay? So that's the context for that situation at that time. So they say, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming as king and the end of the world system that we are in bondage under? Okay? Go ahead and read. And on the end of the world, and Yahshua answered and said unto him, Take heed that no man deceive you. Mm -hmm. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah. Now, see, it's going to be a while. And there's going to be a whole lot of folks coming in his name, saying, I am the Messiah. Okay? And you can go through all kinds of things with that. I'm not going to address all the details of the 24th chapter of Matthew. I'm trying to explain to you what this 24th chapter of Matthew is. It's the answer of Yahshua to the question you just heard from his disciples. What shall, when shall these, these things be? The temple being torn down. What shall be the sign of your coming as king and the end of the world? Go, and he says, see that you be not deceived. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and shall deceive many. Okay? By the way, I believe, if I recall correctly, that the first scripture on the very first aim of this institute is what you just read. Matthew 24, 4, right? Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Isn't that, that's the very first scripture on the very first aim, right? Yeah. So it's interesting that the aim is to help you to find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists in the very first scripture that explains anything about that aim is, see that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and shall deceive many. Go ahead and read. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Not a war, but wars and rumors of wars. And Martha was talking about how that's going on now. Go ahead and read. See that ye be not troubled, mm -hmm. for all these things must come to pass, mm -hmm. but the end is not yet. Yes. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Right. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Right. All these are the beginnings, the beginning of sorrow. This is the end of everything. No. no, it's the beginning of the sorrows or the beginning of the plagues. Okay? All right, go ahead and read. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. There you go, read on. And then shall many be offended, mm -hmm. and shall betray one another, mm -hmm. and shall hate one another. Mm -hmm. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. This is all part of Yahshua's answer to, when will these things be? What's going to be the sign of your coming kingdom in the end of the world or the end of the age? Go ahead and read. And because iniquity shall abound, mm -hmm. the love of many shall wax cold. Right. There's got to be a falling away first. Go ahead. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. And by the way, let me take this opportunity to tell you that the word saved or save in the Bible does not always refer to being saved from sin. There's being saved from many things. Okay? So here he says that he that endureth unto the end, and the same shall be saved. Go ahead and read. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Now, then witness. we go to this verse. Okay? Very important part. And this is part of Yahshua's answer. What shall be the sign of your coming and what? The end of the world. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be what? Shall be preached in all the world. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. How? For a witness... Unto all nations. For a witness unto all nations, please read. And then shall the end come. And then shall the end come. Now, 
Dr. Kinley pointed out back in 1975, this was part of the 1975 International Convention, this was the theme scripture. And it was pointed out how that the gospel that has been promulgated throughout all of Africa and Asia and Europe in the Middle East and everywhere on all these continents, which was done with the armies of Britain, with the armies of the uh, Roman Catholic Papacy, and all these things that are Christian military missions that quote unquote brought the gospel to the heathen, right? Which happened here in the United States and so forth. If their gospel was the gospel of Yahshua, then the end would have already come. Because Yahshua said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Follow me? So, if the end hasn't come, it must be that this gospel has not yet been preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. You understand what I'm saying? And he says in particular, this gospel of the kingdom... And folks, we can't, we can't, shouldn't be, hopefully won't be guilty of the same kind of error that many others have been guilty of and picking out from the whole gospel of Yahshua's kingdom some little piece of it, isolating it from the overall message and saying, this is the gospel, and then not really getting to Yahshua's point or Yahshua's message. You have got to show the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah if you are preaching the gospel. You don't necessarily have to use the word kingdom all the time, but that's what it's about. Okay? That's what he does is bring about his kingdom through his gospel. Okay? So he says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Please read. Matthew 24, 15. Mm -hmm. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Okay, now, we often read that scripture. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Okay, now, Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. If you also recognize that there's another way that this sentence actually is worded and has another aspect to the meaning. Actually, the way that sentence is structured, it would be this. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, then let him that is in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him that is in the housetop not come down out of his house. So forth. Okay? In other words, who is it that he's talking about standing in the holy place? The abomination. The abomination of, of desolation. desolation. Now, what is the abomination of desolation? It basically is Satan in one of his forms of false worship. Right. So when you therefore shall see satanic, corrupt, polluted, false worship, and the idol of that false worship taking the place of the worship of Yahweh in Yahweh's house, then you have seen an abomination that maketh desolate. And when you see that, folks, you better get into the holy place, the real holy place, which is the body of Yahshua the Messiah, and not come out. 
In other words, get out of her, my people, meaning Babylon the Great, and get into Yahshua's church or body or assembly or true temple, which is the spiritual body or temple. That's the holy place. This is the holy place that you want to be in. And I'll tell you, this holy place, Satan can't get in there. But he can get in here. Right. And understand this. Because it's physical, and these are tabernacles or temples, this is where Satan gets in is these things. And when you see him there, you follow me? You get away from the flesh and get into the spirit. In reality. Not some hallucination. Not some fabrication. Okay? So when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, as it says, I think in Luke, standing where it ought not, then you get into the holy place body of Yahshua the Messiah, and if you're elevated on the housetop, up here, don't come down. Right? If you're in the field and fleeing to safety, don't waste time turning back to get your cloak. Follow me? You ain't got time to save the flesh. You get into the truth and you stay there. Okay. Now, that's enough on this. I didn't intend to take all this time on that particular scripture or that context, that, that situation. But I think, I hope at least, that that helps you understand a little bit more about what this whole Matthew 24th chapter is about. Okay? Now, she also, Marta also talked about how back here, when the children of Israel did come into the holy place or the wilderness of Sinai, which is the holy place of the migration, and came to Mount Sinai, which Yahweh called his holy mountain, and Yahweh told Moses this was holy ground or the holy place right here, backside of the mountain. Moses uh, took his shoes off here, so forth. That what had to happen was in order for these people to be joined unto Yahweh or to be part of his kingdom, there had to be a purification. And I want that word to sink in, purification. Because a lot of times we don't think of that in connection with bloody sacrifices. I mean, it's very, I mean, we don't think of something becoming bloody as cleaning it. You know what I'm saying? But the blood of Yahshua cleanseth us from all sin. And you are washed in the blood of the Lamb. And you are made white or cleansed, your soul we're talking about. By the blood of Yahshua. Folks, without this man coming into this physical body, shedding that physical blood, there could be no salvation. There could be no peace between you and Yahweh. You would be destined for the lake of fire with no possible recourse without this man shedding his physical blood. And that is part of a message that has become... Uh, very skewed. Many people in the institute, in churches, don't believe at all <laughs> in the value of the blood of Yahshua the Messiah. Right. <laughs> and they don't understand it. I want you to understand that Yahshua's physical death, physical blood, was vitally important. Right. Okay? So if you would go back to Exodus 24 and read where she read and then go over to Hebrews 19, start at verse 15. And I'm probably not even going to get to the other subject material. We'll get to that another time. Exodus 24 and 9? Mm -hmm. All right. Then when uh, Moses... Well, actually, no, ma'am. Uh, go back. You can read quickly. Start at the first verse. All right. Exodus 24 and 1. And he said unto Moses, Come up unto Yahweh, Yahweh. Thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. Okay, so 
Joshua, Joshua said unto Moses, Come up unto Yahweh, you, Moses, Aaron, Adab, by you, and seventy of the elders of Israel, onto the plateau of this mountain, and you worship afar off from the peak from the top. Because in the peak on the top, that's where the pillar of fire is with the cloud of smoke all around it, and where the presence of Yahweh is, and you get there, you're dead. Okay? All right, go ahead and read. And worship ye afar off, mm -hmm. and Moses alone shall come near Yahweh. Moses alone and by himself is allowed to come near Yahweh. There's only one. Why? Because he is a type and shadow of who? Yahshua the Messiah. So folks, you and I cannot just go to Yahweh on our own. Yahshua the Messiah has to be the one and the only one that can go to Yahweh on our behalf. There is no mediator between Yahweh and men like Moses, but there is the mediator called the man, Yahshua the Messiah. The man, Yahshua the Messiah. And that's what the Bible says. The man, Yahshua the Messiah. And I'm here to tell you that the man, Yahshua the Messiah, is not only in a spiritual body, but he is in flesh. Right now, present. And he is the mediator between Yahweh and men. Now, if you don't understand that, we can talk about that. Okay? But, I, but this is very important to understand. Yahshua is not somewhere else in some abstract form, some invisible form, and you cannot properly just make him into your image and pretend that Yahshua is the way you think and want him to be. That's he right. is as he is. That's right. And it's your job and my job to receive and accept him as he is. That's right. Not like we want him to be. Amen. Okay? And this shows you, and it's everybody's tendency to do it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All of these people that went up on this mountain, they saw him with the feet, the body, the hands, and every blasted last one of them, except Moses, who was all, who stayed up there, came back down here and participated in making something with horns, hoofs, and a tail. Mm -hmm. And saying, this is the Elohim that brought us up out of the land of Egypt. This is proof that many shall come in the name of Yahshua. They called this Elohim. After he said, I'm Elohim, they call all kinds of things Yahshua or use Yahshua as a front for all kinds of other things. Jesus is, has an image attached to that name, which is not the true image of Yahshua. You can make all kinds of false idols and put an image, a wrong image on them, and attach them to Yahshua. You can attach Dr. Kinley to Yahshua and make Dr. Kinley a false image. You can attach any minister or person to him and say, this is him. This is his image. You can attach your own image of yourself. And that is what people do. They want this one themselves to be the good guy. And so now, what I do is I make Yahshua into my own image. That's bull. <laughs> that's what they did here. See what I'm saying? So, that's, Yahshua said, many shall come in my name, saying, I am Messiah and deceive many. Follow me? All right. And that's, I, I'm sorry, that's true of many claiming the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm sorry. Many claim the Holy Spirit and it's not in them. And they're lying and deceiving themselves. Now, read on there for where you're at. So they, go ahead and read. Exodus 24 and 2. And Moses alone shall come near Yahweh, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. Okay. And Moses came and told the people all the words of Yahweh. Stop. Now, a lot of times, well, let me just ask. 
What are the words of Yahweh? Yes, we did. You are correct. When he says the words of Yahweh, he is talking about specifically the Ten Commandments. Now, how do I prove that? Uh, put a finger right there and go back to Exodus 20, verse 1. Exodus 20 and 1. Mm-hmm. Oh, shoot. Exodus 21. And Please Elohim read. spake all these words. Saying, Wait a minute. He spoke what? All these words. Oh. So what follows is the words of Yahweh, or words of Yahweh Elohim. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Saying what? Oh. Saying. I can quote it if you. I am Yahweh thy Elohim, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt help have no other gods before me. Stop. Now what did she just read? The first commandment of the Ten Commandments. Okay? And you read right on through there, and you'll read the Ten Commandments. So those are the words of Yahweh. Now, when you go back over to Exodus 24, verse... Where were you at? What, what verse? 20, uh, 24 and 3. 3. All Moses... Go ahead. Okay, sorry. On the words of Yahweh and all the judgments... And all the judgments or the ordinances... Mm -hmm. Okay. Now those are recorded there in Exodus 20, uh, later 21. on, in ex, you know, from Exodus 21 and through, through 23. 23. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Mm -hmm. All right. Go ahead and read. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which Yahweh Elohim has said, will we do? So the people all answered together in one voice and said, all the words that Yahweh, have sell, Yahweh Elohim have said, will we do? Go ahead and read. And Moses wrote all the words of Yahweh and rose up early in the morning. So then what Moses did was he made a record of the agreement. He made the book of the covenant <laughs> or the book of the agreement. And it was a book that had to be signed. How was it signed? In blood. So Yahweh spoke the words, the people agreed, Moses wrote the book of the covenant, and it was signed in blood. Please read. And rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill. I'm meaning Mount Sinai. Go ahead. And twelve pillars, according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings. You know, I'm sorry. I, I've got to say something. <laughs> I was resisting this, but I'm going to say it. I just want you to understand. I just want you to understand people will go anywhere with crazy stuff. So I want you to guard against it. Okay? Where did it say he built the altar? Under the hill. Now, do you realize what some people think that means? Underground. What's that? Underground. Yes, underground. And they actually imagine it this way. That this mountain floated up in the air. Really? And that yeah, what the people heard. did was go yeah. underneath a floating mountain. Wow. I'm telling you, people can come up with all kinds of things. Okay. And, of course, I've offended somebody by saying that. But that's what people do. Go ahead and read. Mm. And twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, mm -hmm. which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto Yahweh. Okay, so... Go ahead and read. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Okay, so wait a minute. He took half of the blood and put it in basins, mm -hmm. and half of the blood he sprinkled on this altar that he built at the base of the mountain. Go ahead. And he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And then he took the book of the covenant. Now, what was in the book of the covenant? The Ten Commandments, the judgments. Right. It's, you just read it. Moses wrote these things, right? Okay. 
Go ahead and read. And they said, all that Yahweh hath said will we do. So they confirmed what they already agreed to. They confirmed. They said, yes, all the Yahweh hath said, we will do. Go ahead. And be obedient. And we will obey. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and read. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. So and said, he signed it. This is the closing. You follow me? The deal is closed, sealed, signed. Right. It's a marriage covenant. It's a contractual agreement. Okay. All right. So he took the blood and he sprinkled it where? On the people. On the book. On the, on the people. Took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. Yep. And said, behold. And he also sprinkled it on the book. He sprinkled it on the book. Go ahead and read. Um, and said, behold, the blood of the covenant which Yahweh hath made with you concerning all these Behold, parts. the blood of the covenant which Yahweh hath made with who? All you, you, children of Israel, okay, 12 tribes, right? 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes. Go ahead and read. Okay, 9. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. Now, it was not until that covenant was signed and sealed and delivered that they were allowed to come up on this mountain, okay? All right, and... I think he wanted 6 again. Okay, go ahead. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled it on the altar. Yeah. And he took the book of the covenant. No, I'm sorry. Never mind. Okay. You'll see. <laughs> Just be patient. Okay. All right. Now, go over to Hebrews, the ninth chapter. All right. And go over to the middle of the chapter, about the, maybe about the 15th verse. Hebrews 9 and 15. Actually, for context, go to, go to the first verse. Okay. 9 and 1. Mm -hmm. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Stop. Let me explain something about what Paul is writing to these people. He's talked about, right back at the very beginning of the book of Hebrews, about how Yahshua the Messiah is ruler of heaven and earth, and man was made a little lower than the angels, but Yahweh hath put in a mystery and favored man. And that there is no mediator between man and Yahweh except Yahshua himself. And he goes on and he describes various different things about the uh, covenant agreement that went on with Abraham, where Yahweh gave Abraham the promise and told him that his seed would have the promised land, and that back at that time, this was before this old covenant law, and that Yahweh made the promise before the law, the law intervened, and what happened was Yahweh had a priesthood even before the priesthood under this law with There was a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, which was timeless or eternal in its symbolism. And since that priesthood was first before the old covenant was made, that eternal priesthood of Melchizedek would also continue after this one, this physical Levitical priesthood, ended. That this one had a beginning and an ending. The priests themselves had a beginning and an ending of ministry. Twenty years and out, as far as service in the tabernacle. Going to high priest of 30, had to no longer do service in the tabernacle after 50. Doesn't mean they were useless, but they were retired, kind of like consultants or something in the modern language. But this priesthood had a beginning and an ending. The Melchizedek priesthood, which is a symbol of the priesthood of Joshua the Messiah, has no beginning and ending, it's from eternity. Okay? And this kingdom is the kingdom of Yahshua, which is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, not in physical buildings. with a physical worship. In Old Testament type of shadow worship with an eternal spiritual thing that came before the physical and will continue after the physical and be even greater in glory. Okay? Now I kind of summarized some things up through the seventh chapter of Hebrews. And in the eighth chapter of Hebrews, I think I, I think I want to do this for context, just read eight and one. Hebrews eight and one. 
Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Stop. Seven chapters he's spoken already. Now he's going to summarize the high point of where he's gotten to. Of the things that we have spoken, this is the sum. Please read. We have such an holy... No. I'm sorry. We have such an high priest. We have such a high priest. What do you mean such a high priest? It's a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. We have this eternal high priest. Okay? Who is what? Such an high priest. Yes. Who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. This high priest is not sitting up in a physical temple. He's not sitting up in a physical tabernacle. He is set at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And I want you to understand this. This is key and very important. Listen to me closely. Nobody other than Yahshua has gone to heaven and stayed there. Yahshua is alone in heaven in immortality. Others have been translated out of the physical world. But they have not yet gone into heaven or received the promise and immortal glorification. Which, right, they're under the altar waiting. That's exactly right. And so, and this gets to the point where I was really trying to get to. What will the new heaven and earth be like? Be it is. It's like Yahshua's body and the angels of Elohim in heaven. That's how our bodies are going to be. Only there's even details and mysteries attached with that, which he has given us clues to in the scriptures. But that's a later lecture. Not yet. No. So, what I'm trying to explain is, he's talked about the fact that there's physical Levitical priesthood, there's a, there's a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, which is eternal. Yahshua's priesthood is the eternal act of the order of Melchizedek. He did not come as a Levite. He came out of the tribe of Judah, right, which is the kingship tribe. He is the king and priest. Now, why Melchizedek? What does the word Melchizedek mean? Melchi means what? Melchi is king. And Zedek is righteousness. So Melchizedek is the what? King of righteousness. And where was his capital? Salem. Salem, peace. which means what? Peace. Shalom, peace. Right? Now, where is Salem? Jerusalem. Yerushalom. That's where it is. Yerushalom. Okay? Or Yerushalayim. How do you pronounce it? I'm not a Hebrew-speaking person. But that's where it is. That's where the capital is, folks. But... Paul is also going to write about the fact that there is a Jerusalem above in the spirit, which is the mother of us all, not just Jerusalem beneath. This one is a type and shadow. Melchizedek was not, listen to me, Melchizedek was not Yahshua the Messiah. And many people believe he was. He was not. And he did have physical parents. But they were not recorded in the genealogy, so as far as the records go, he was without father and mother in the records, without descent or children in the records, but he was a type of the Most High, Yahshua the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And so his kingdom was a type and shadow also. You follow me? But now... Yahshua is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek or in the eternal priesthood. Okay, so in the eighth chapter of Hebrews, he says, of the things that we have spoken or written, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, not in Jerusalem, not in a physical temple, but in the true heavens or in the spirit. Follow me? And I'm telling you, he is there alone at, other than his angels at this point. Okay, in other words, what I'm saying is people have not died and gone to heaven. <laughs> okay? That's what I'm trying to explain to you. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Now go ahead and read. Mm -hmm. Oh, goodness. A go minister. To the, uh, yeah, go, go to the ninth verse. We got a okay. ninth chapter. Nine we got to move. All right. 
9 and 1. Mm -hmm. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service. Now he's going back and explaining the comparison between this old covenant and the new covenant. Now that he's established that there is a new covenant and a spiritual kingdom and eternal priesthood, okay, now he's going to do a comparison between the, priest, uh, the, the priesthood and the covenant back here uh, uh, with Israel and the one of Yahshua the Messiah. Read on. Okay. Had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Okay, say so it had orders of service and a worldly sanctuary for the services. Go ahead. For there was a tabernacle made. There was a tabernacle made, and he describes it. Now go on down to the ninth verse. Nine and nine, which was a figure for the time then present. Now the priest services and the sacrifices in that tabernacle was a figure. It was not the reality, and it was not eternal. It was a figure, and it was to be there for the time that was then present, but remember, there is an eternal priesthood that it represents. Go ahead and read. In which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and in diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. So even those sacrifices and services couldn't even make the priest himself perfect in his soul or conscience. Follow me? Couldn't even cleanse that priest. It atoned and put aside the wrath of Yahweh for those sins for a time, but it was not an eternal answer to the problem of sin and separation from Yahweh. Okay? So, that old covenant, there was no eternal hope in it, but it was there to hold them over and to bring them unto Yahshua the Messiah. But now once the Messiah comes in, you've got to recognize the Messiah as the reality, not the types and the shadows. Okay? All right, please continue. Mm -hmm. Which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings. Now that whole old covenant stood only in meats and drinks, meaning ceremonial meals, okay, and various washings, which is the same as baptisms, okay, there's multiple types of cleansing rituals, washings, go ahead. And carnal ordinances. And they were carnal ordinances, they were not spiritual ordinances. Mm -hmm. Now they represented the spirit law, but they were not spirit, right. they pertained to the flesh. Right. Go ahead and read. Imposed on them until the time of reformation. And it was imposed on the Jews, never was on the Gentiles, and it was only imposed on them until the time that Yahshua reformed the relationship or the covenant between Yahweh and the people. Mm -hmm. And the people that it had to be reformed with, was the people that Yahweh first formed it with. He formed it with the Jews. He reforms it with the Jews, or the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Then the reformed relationship under a new covenant, which is spiritual, will be extended to Gentiles. Okay? All right, please read. 11. But the Messiah being come and high priest of good things to come mm -hmm. by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Yahshua did not work with this tabernacle and this temple back here, okay? So, uh, as far as being a high priest, okay? So the Messiah came, a high priest of good things to come by a greater and a more perfect tabernacle. Please read. Not made with hands. Not a physical human building. So I don't care if they rebuild the Herodian temple that was torn down in A.D. 70, if they rebuild another temple on Temple Mount in Jerusalem, that's not where Yahshua is the priest. But folks, many, many, many beliefs today require a temple to be built there on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Why? Because they have to, in their mind, have a temple there for Jesus or Yahshua or the 13th Imam that's the Islam. that's the Islamic Messiah 
That's the, the, the Shia Islamic Messiah who will come and defeat the enemies. The great war of Armageddon. The great uh, I, I forget, I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't remember all the Islamic terms and so forth, but they have very similar ideas. Mm -hmm. This is the thing, folks. The Jews, the Muslims, the Christians, many of them all have this same type of mythology, and they are expecting this great cataclysmic war to occur and the Savior to come and present himself and defeat their enemies. And it's just like two football teams. Both of them praying to God for victory to destroy the other team. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. <laughs> and in their beliefs, once this war takes place somewhere outside of Jerusalem in the Middle East, maybe the valley or the mountain of Megiddo, or some other place like that, then Jesus or the Messiah or the 13th Imam, or whoever it is, is going to come and come into Jerusalem and set up a physical kingdom in Jerusalem. That's the concept. That's the concept. And if you believed in that, you, if you really believed in that, you would do everything you could to prepare for it. Like, you'd make sure a temple was built. Or you'd make sure that there was a great war between the, the Islamic brothers mm. and all the Jewish Christian infidels. Mm -hmm. You would do this to bring it on. You understand what I'm saying? This is why the people, they don't get it. They think, oh, everybody's supposed to try and get along in peace and harmony. It's not <laughs> in the underlying belief system. Right, that's right. That's right. Do you follow me? It's about a kingdom. That means a victory and a destruction of the king's enemies. Yahshua does not make a truce and a peace treaty with Satan. He destroys him. Period. And so this concept about just making peace with everybody will never fly when people have this idea. Do you understand this? Yep. <laughs> and it is about the kingdom of Yahshua. That's and Yahshua is going to destroy the enemies. Right. But folks, it's not going to be physical. Right. And when it happens in the way that the finality of it, mm. the, it will be far worse for the enemies of Yahshua than any man could do in torture and killing for a physical body because mm -hmm. it will be throughout eternity and so yes it is about being prepared for the kingdom of Yahshua but it's a spiritual kingdom I digress slightly but not much please continue on okay um, I got three minutes mm -hmm. and you have one more scripture to it yep okay um, 11. But the Messiah, being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, mm -hmm. neither by the blood of goats and calves. Yahshua did not come in by the blood of goats and calves. The New Testament doesn't come in that way. Go ahead. But by his own blood. But he, by the blood of Yahshua. Folks, you've got to have pure blood mm -hmm. to wash away sin. Mm -hmm. Just pure that. life. Because that's what blood is, is life. Mm -hmm. It says in the scriptures, the blood thereof is the life thereof. You cannot take a dirty rag to clean up a dirty mess mm -hmm. and make it clean. Mm -hmm. You have to have clean blood, clean life to cleanse the life of those that are stained by sin. Mm -hmm. Please read. Mm -hmm. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once... Now, Yahshua did this once. He died physically and shed his blood for sin once. And he died, he was buried, he raised as a quickening spirit and ascended to the Father. And the Father has him in heaven glorified. Go ahead and read. Into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And he obtained eternal redemption for us. Please read. For if the blood of bulls and of goats 
and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. That's what they did back here when they dedicated the covenant. Okay, that's what they did when they dedicated the tabernacle. Please read. How much more should the Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to Yahweh, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living Yahweh? Yahshua the Messiah cleanses your soul or your conscience. This priest back here in those offerings couldn't cleanse the consciences at all. Yahshua works on the soul inside. Please read quickly. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. And because of that, he can mediate and bring about the New Testament. Please read. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. Stop. I'm not going to have time to give you details. By means of Yahshua's death, and I would say also burial and resurrection, Yahshua redeemed those that were transgressors under the First Testament. Right? Mm -hmm. Folks, that's the Jews. That's not you Gentiles. That's the Jews. Now, I need to go over to other scriptures, and I'll point you to Romans 3.25 as an example that specifies that Yahshua took care of sins that are past, which includes the sin of Adam, which was inherited by everybody, including the Gentiles. Yahshua's sacrifice, burial, and resurrection redeemed mankind from the sin of Adam and redeemed Israel from the sin of that old covenant. Please read on in Hebrews. Oh, okay. I need to get to a point quickly. Um, for, let me go back. And for, for then must he often, go ahead and read. And for this cause, he is the meteor of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And it's only to those that are called and heed the call. Please read. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Yes. Please read. Can't have a New Testament at his birth. It's got to be after his death. Go ahead and read. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Right. Other Look, this Old Testament didn't go into effect until Moses slaughtered those animals, symbolizing the death. Okay, please read. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. That's right. Whereupon neither... So you cannot have the New Testament and grace until Yahshua the Messiah dies. Mm -hmm. That's right. And is buried in raises. Mm -hmm. Please read. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. This testament was dedicated with blood. Please read. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according... He wrote the words of Yahweh. He spoke the words of Yahweh. When Moses uh, wrote and spoke all every precept of the law. Please read. According to the law, uh -huh. he took the blood of calves and of goats with water... And scarlet wool. See, Paul fills in some details that mm -hmm. you didn't read back in Exodus 24. Right. So he took the blood of bulls and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop. Please read. And hyssop and sprinkled both the book and the people. He sprinkled both the book and the people. Please read. Saying, this is the blood of the testament which Yahweh hath enjoined unto you. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Please read. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels. Of and so the tabernacle, before it could be uh, erected, had to be sprinkled with blood. Okay, please read. All the vessels of the ministry. Right. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Huh? Please read. And without shedding of blood, is no remission. So there has to be a purification by the washing of blood. And without blood washing, there is no remission of the sins. Yahshua's blood is necessary, folks, whether we understand it or not. And if you omit that, you, you've missed the point. All right. Why, we're, why does it say almost? <clears throat> Almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. All right, we're, I, we're over time. I'm going to have to close for now. 
And I hope this has been beneficial, helpful in some respect. Praise Yahshua. Thank you, Dr. Welch. Um, classes are held every Wednesday and Friday from 7 to 9, to 9 p.m. and Sunday from 11 to 1. Fundamental and regular instructor meetings are posted on the whiteboard. Our reminder of school is supported by our members. Pleasures to do at the beginning of each month. Donations are welcome and greatly appreciated. From the Director of Public Relations, classes will be on Ustream, Facebook. Uh, we have YouTube and LansingBible.Weebly.com. Director donations for the Ustream project is greatly appreciated. Please do not enter the room during the moderation prayer or reading of the scripture. There is a spiritual op operation going on. Uh, if you're interested in Springfield, you need to have notification to them by October 1st. And then April of 2014 is a north side Chicago event. That's all stand to be dismissed. We'll be quoting from the last two verses of the book of Jude out of the Holy Name Bible. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time, now and ever, as you nightly say, hallelujah.
they're spreading around Divine intervention is nice If God is ever around They don't want to believe Their every step was patterned by him That he's got it wrapped up tight Line upon line They're going back to spirit again He's got it wrapped up tight Line upon line They're going back to spirit again shape 